Thanks for staying with us. Now, independence is important for a country because it's the very reason for the country's existence. A country or a nation without uh, wouldn't exist or have a distinct identity if it weren't independent in the first place. Now, in 1960, Nigeria became independent, uh, became an independent country. However, are we truly reaping the benefits of being independent? My son, my young son once asked me, Mommy, why didn't we stay colonized? Maybe from his own myopic mind, <laughs> you know, maybe he's seen that British, the British um, people, they are doing a lot more better than us in Nigeria. So that's why we have Cheta Wanze here. He is the lead partner at SBM Intelligence, a geopolitical research firm based in Lagos, and he has joined the conversation. Now, remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at Plus TV Africa. Or at Waste Your Africa One with the hashtag Waste, or you send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-803-84663. Thank you so much for joining us, Cheta. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Good evening. It's such a pleasure, pleasure to have you. So, Cheta, I want us to, because this conversation today is um, America's independence, right? So I think somehow, somehow, someone said something to me that since Donald Trump became president in Nigeria, in America, it has given us the right to be able to compare ourselves <laughs> with America. But that's just an aside, like a joke. But um, in your rating, right, was it a right move for Nigeria to gain independence? Was it too, was it premature or was it a good thing? That's a, that's a very, very complicated question. It's, it doesn't, um, it's, it has no direct answer. Um, let's first, let's get one thing straight first off the bat. Nigeria in, um, was not meant to be as it were. I mean, I'm quoting our founding fathers, our so-called founding fathers, because uh, the truth of the matter is that our founding father is Frederick Lugard, who decided for um, administrative and economic convenience to bring these various peoples together. But as of 1947, um, uh, Amadou Bello refers to the mistake of 1914. Remember that Nigeria was amalgamated in, uh, on January 1st, 1914. Um, Amadou Bello referred to the mistake of 1914, which is the amalgamation. And uh, a year later, Awulowo said um, Nigeria is a mere geographical expression. Um, when Peter Enahoro moved the motion for independence in 1953, the northern region felt it wasn't ready and opposed the move for independence. Um, the Peter Enahoro's motion for independence wanted Nigeria to attain independence in 1956. But because the northern region was not ready, we ended up having it uh, pushed back by four years. Now, I think it's, it's necessary for us to take the wider geopolitical um, Caleb, uh, uh, milieu at the time. Remember that 17 African countries got independence in 1960. So it was not a case of that the colonial um, rulers wanted to leave. They were forced to leave. You see, the Second World War, which ended in 1945, left all of them very broke and really unable to manage their empires. And then the, um, the Cold War, in which America and the Soviet Union were fighting for uh, supremacy in the world, ensured that America insisted that all of them free their empires. So that was essentially what happened. So, um, are we really independent? I don't think we are. The truth is, a lot of our elites, for example, have most of their wealth outside of the country. Nigeria is still beholden in many respects to foreign interests. Depending on what part of Nigeria you are in, you are either beholden to interest in London or you are beholden to interest in Arabia. Um, but for the most part, our elites have their legs outside of Nigeria. That's not independence. So is Nigeria independence? Politically, yes. Um, after a fashion, because we make some decisions or we make a lot of decisions by ourselves, economically, the answer is no. So, <laughs> do, so do we say that Nigeria has encountered growth in infrastructure and governance post-independence? The answer to that is yes. 
um, you only need to look at the model for colonialism because I think one problem that we have is that we tend to look at the, uh, the colonial era with rose tinted spectacles. Consider this the British civil service in Nigeria was never more than a thousand people. As of, the, as of independence, Nigeria was a country of 47 million people. So how did a thousand people keep control, uh, keep, in the, uh, keep command of 47 million? It was through brutal methods. That's just that's just the fact. That's something we need to be um, we need to be very um, uh, we need to understand that the the British were not benign colonists. They were very brutal. They kept Nigeria's population in check through very brutal methods. And the infrastructure that they built, I mean, you only look, need to look at the rail lines, for example. The rail lines were built in such a way that they started from the hinterland and brought things out to the, to the coast for exports to the so-called mother country. That was it. They were not concerned with building. The natural thing for the British would have been to build connections between the eastern and western parts of the country. And eastern and western, uh, most Nigerians, when you say east and west, they think of the southeast and southwest. Mm -hmm. There's a northeast and there's a northwest. The British didn't connect those to those places. It was just, it's, the model was all about exporting. The only place where the two, uh, the two rail lines intersected was in Katanchan. And that was, uh, that it intersected there in order to be able to cross um, labor for, again, for extracting industries. So, one of the big problems of Nigeria, as it is right now, is the fact that we did not um, change the British model. We basically, if you look at um, the economic zones that Nigeria has, uh, that, Nigeria, that, that Nigeria developed, they were actually modeled after the British model. So take, for example, Lakaji, which I'm sure you've heard of, the economic zone that starts from Lagos here, runs through Kano and ends in Jibia, in, um, in Katsina State. That essentially follows the rail line all the way from Karana Moda to Lagos. That's, a, that's essentially it. The second national economic corridor, which has more or less been abandoned, also, if that runs from Osaka to Beduguri, it's again, it follows the old rail line from Nguru all the way to, um, to Osaka. So we haven't built on anything. And you can see it in almost everything that we do. Our police, the model our police still operates is still very much the model that the colonists um, developed in 1929 in the response to the about women's riots. And that is what we have done. So essentially, what happened in 1960 was that the police, the military, whoever, they simply changed masters, nothing else. All right, um, um, I definitely, Cheta, right? I, I definitely do agree with you when you said that our independent, politically we are independent, but mentally and economically we are definitely not there yet. Now, a lot of Nigerians would argue that um, when it comes to independence that we don't value it because we did not fight for it unlike other countries for instance america and a couple of other countries who literally have to um, drew um, blood yeah and every year there's a memorial for fallen soldiers so these people say that if we had had a battle or some some war or something that we would value our independence more and attach a lot more meaning to october 1st what do you think I have two answers to that. Ghana and Botswana, they didn't exactly fight for independence either. Um, the, the, in Ghana, Nkrumah put pressure on the on the British. Um, yes, that you can you can say that uh, the British treated him a lot more harshly than they treated um, uh, Amadou Bello, Awolo, and Azikiwe. Um, but nevertheless, the, the, uh, Nkrumah was sent to prison but he did not pick up arms. In Botswana, um, uh, 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 Seret, uh, sorry, I keep forgetting his name, he did not pick up arms either. Now, in Kenya, on the other hand, they picked up arms, the Mau Mau. Who is doing better now, Kenya or Botswana? So that theory does not necessarily hold. In India, they didn't exactly pick up arms against the British. They followed Mahatma Gandhi's uh, model of uh, peaceful resistance and the very day after independence india fell apart so that theory when you when you put that theory under closer scrutiny mm. no it doesn't stand up okay so cheta 
I like the fact you're talking about changing the British model because it seems like, yes, we, we, we had gained independence, but we got stuck in the process, you know, and we've not been able to change that, that um, what's it called, that model. So first of all, the, the, I would like to understand the British model for even the, the process of our independence. Is it favorable across all zones in Nigeria or is it just favoring a particular um, ethnic region? Bearing in mind with, um, I mean, politically, it seems like it's only zoning towards probably the Western region and the Northern region. We haven't seen much growth within the Eastern region. So that's the that's the first um, analysis I would like to understand. You know, is it was it meant to be like that? That structure. That if we were to change that model, what should we be doing? So what the British did here, which is pretty much what they did in every country that they colonized but did not settle. Um, I think it's important to point out that countries, some countries were colonized and settled. So you have. Um, South Africa, you have Canada, you have Australia as uh, very good examples. Other countries were colonized but not settled. Nigeria being an example, India being another example, Kenya being another example. Although there were, there were attempts to start to settle Kenya, but those attempts started late. Um, and by the time they started, the, uh, the British Empire was no longer as strong as it used to be. Now, one thing that the British did in all the big countries that they colonized but did not settle, India being an example, Nigeria being another example, was that they practiced divide and rule. They brought disparate natives together and then essentially gave power to one set of people yeah. to lord it over the rest. That was, their, that was their strategy. That was the only way you would find a thousand people being able to rule over 47 million, mm. as was the case in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. That was the only way you will find 5,000 people, because the British Raj at its height in India consisted of 5,000 civil servants, ne never more. That was the way you will find 5,000 people being able to rule over 500 million, mm. which was the case in India. Now, in setting all those people up against one another, the British ensured that those people were at each other's throats, and then they could lead. The difference between Nigeria and India was that India fell apart the day after. So India had attained independence from Britain on the 15th of August 1947, and their civil war started the very next day. Mm. And by the end of the civil war, they were left with two countries, India and Pakistan. Pakistan yeah. And Pakistan itself, Pakistan itself further split into two. So we now have India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the three, the three, um, tri the unbalanced tripod that the, in the British set up in India. In Nigeria, we had we also had an unbalanced tripod: the northern region, the western region, and the eastern region. Um, and shortly after independence, the eastern region, because of the uh, of the misbehavior of Namibia and Sikkim, it must be said, uh, split into two. When what is now southern Cameroon and Bazonia opted to leave Nigeria and join with Cameroon, so it's it's reduced the strength of the eastern region itself in Parliament. But the way the British structured the country, if we had maintained that northern, eastern, and western uh, thing, the the the, no, the uh, west and the east combined would never have been as strong as the north. Now, it is important to note that shortly after the uh, the east splits and the, and, uh, the southern Cameroons left, the west splits into the midwest and the west. Mm -hmm. But the north. When, there were, when, when you have the teeth in, in what is now the Middle Belt trying to, um, to split away from the North, it was brutally suppressed, very brutally. Yeah. So you had a situation where, as of the end of our first republic, in the, uh, what I call the mistake of January 15, 1966, mm -hmm. uh, because that coup should never have happened. That coup, yeah. We've never recovered from that coup as a country. Mm -hmm. as, of, as of when that thing happened, the North was in a position where it, it probably could have been able to rule ad infinitum. Because again, they had the, they had the not higher number of seats in parliament, one, but more importantly, they also had primacy of force. So there was there was a, a sort of arrangement where quotas were introduced into recruitment into the Nigerian military. 
and the north got 50 percent the west got 25 percent and the east got 25 percent so there was that unhealthy balance that yes. we were left with as of october 1st 1960 mm -hmm. and we've never because we, um, there are so many things um, we run a system of sharing dwindling resources rather than productivity mm -hmm. so we've never really had the incentive to change that system mm -hmm. until we change our system from sharing sharing whatever we take up from the ground to one that is focused on productivity mm -hmm. unless that happens we will not see a change in the um, we will not see a change in what we run okay so um, we've been hearing this um, saying, our unity in diversity, since we were kids. Okay, so let's... <laughs> <laughs> unity in diversity, it's the truth. So let's look at this from this context. Where did this thing actually come from? Colonial powers were able to colonize Nigeria as a result of the fact that there were rivalries between the leaders in Nigeria. The, protect, the Southern Protectorate and the Northern Protectorate. So, and this still plays out in the political scene we have today. Do you consider unity in the North and the South Protectorate a blessing or a curse? Let's get one thing straight. The, the colonists did not colonize us because there were rivalries between our so-called leaders. Um, you have to go back 150 years from now to see to look at what the map was as of the time the colonists uh, were coming in. So first, you had a situation where um, there were two, there were two big empires or three, depending on who you speak with. You had the Sokoto Empire, uh, or called the Sokoto Caliphate, uh, which controlled large parts of what is now northern Nigeria. Um, now, the Sokoto Caliphate had been created about five decades before, uh, before that, before 1860. And as of the time, as of 1860, it was already facing, it was already having internal stress with different uh, factions having their own um, uh, uh, attempts at rebellion. Then you had the Oyo Empire, uh, which, was in, which was in rapid decline. What is now Yoruba land was full of war factions. Um, as a matter of fact, the existing Yoruba identity was created shortly after, um, at the end of the Kiriji Wars of, uh, the, of the late 18th century. Then you had the Bini Empire, which itself was also in decline, but controlled a lot of trade in what is now the Niger Delta. The British, um, and this wasn't even the British crown, the, uh, the Royal Niger Company was granted um, a charter, um, what the language now is called incorporation was granted a charter to exclusively import palm oil from this region to Britain. Now, you look at the context of Britain at the time. Britain was emerging from the um, uh, uh, was was emerging from the Industrial Revolution, and they needed raw materials. Mm -hmm. Palm oil was one of the Very things that was needed as a lubricant for their industries. Mm -hmm. um, so they needed to get this. They signed all sorts of trade deals. And then they used force because they wanted to get the materials, the, the raw materials, as cheaply as possible. They used they used coercion. Um, I mean, th this was that was the era of gunboat diplomacy. They would coerce some uh, pliant powers into coming, and then they formed something called the Royal West African Frontier Force, where they used willing natives to bring down empires that had long lasted. And they had an advantage. They had the matching gun, which was something that our people had no idea of how to fight. So okay. they, they built this, um, uh, this empire, and they were more interested in developing this, uh, developing extractive uh, purposes, extractive mm -hmm. industries for palm oil from the southern parts. Mm -hmm. Then cocoa came, came shortly after. Cocoa, which, was, which could be converted Chata, to chocolate. You know they um, were not as interested in... Chata, Pardon? let me take a quick yeah. break because this seems to be a very lengthy answer. We'll take a short break. Let's pay our bills. We'll be right back. <laughs>